Uh, if you adhere closely to the rules of penmanship, it's been a long time since I've been in school, but you remember those times where you know, uh, they had the little uh, letters up above the chalkboard. Okay, you, f you form your letter like this, and you form your T's like this. Uh, if, you adhere, if you sign your name so close to that style of penmanship, then that will be real easy for someone to copy your signature. Because all they, oh, okay, I'm just going to remember what it was like in first grade and just copy that same thing. And also, the signature, if the signature is legible, that makes it more susceptible to have, being, uh, having it copied. Okay. Now, I touched on a few of these uh, earlier. Uh, some ways of, uh, in a sense, forgery proof or reduce the chances that your signature are copied is, you know, form all the letters without shortcuts. Okay. Um, one thing to do is, is the more complex your signature, the harder it is to copy. All right. And one thing that people do is they would have one style of signature for their public signatures like contracts and credit cards and so forth and another style for correspondence, greeting cards and letters and stuff like that. Uh, concentrate your embellishments to the lower letters because it's not like I mentioned on the video, if someone's going to try to, to copy your signature, they're going to be more in, in, uh, inclined to make the first letters of your first and last name look similar and they're going to let it go at that. Okay. Uh, again, ra write rapidly with long, broad, sweeping strokes. Um, how many people still write checks? Okay, a few. If you write checks, now you all know that, that when you're mailing a check out, you're not supposed to put it in the mailbox with a little red flag up. Because that's a little red flag to the criminals. And there's people that actually go around driving in neighborhoods, and when they see that little red flag up, it's like, okay, let me well, take it in there and see what's. And they would take that, that check that you wrote out to your mortgage company or Visa or whatever, and what they would do is they'd soak it in acetone based solution, and the ink that you wrote on the check literally lifts off the check. Okay, so when they dry it, and, and, and the, the, the solution is, is, as, as it is, when a check dries, it's not like a, a wet piece of paper. I mean, it, it, it still maintains its, its uh, uh, components of, of, of uh, flexibilities and, and texture and stuff like that. So it's, it, it doesn't feel to the hand like it's been washed or, or wet. But, I mean, literally, the, the, the ink from that check literally lifts off and a person has a blank check. Okay, and the worst types of pens that do this is your little ballpoint big pens that you bet, you know, 10 in a pack at Harris Teeter. Okay, those are, in fact, that's what those are from. All right, what I would suggest is get in a pen and if you're doing checks, use a gel-based ink, okay? Only the gel-based inks is impervious to this type of solution. All right. In fact, uh, I would uh, go as far as to say, get a particular pen that, and does anybody have like a pen that you just really love? That's your favorite pen and you just can't write without that pen? If you could have a pen like, like that or, or go to Office Depot, get a special pen like an executive pen and stuff like that. And again, not, not the 10 of the pack thing at Harris Tweeter, but, and use that pen only for your public signatures, your, your contracts, your credit cards and so forth. Okay. So if someone steals, you know, your checkbook or starts forging your name on, on documents, unless they stole your pen, you know, and we would need the originals because, you know, this, this pen, the ink on it, fluoresces at a different wavelength than the, pink, the, the pen that you have, okay? So we'd be able to show on, uh, under a microscope, under ultra, uh, infrared light, where, the, uh, where these pens were different. And sometimes, if we're, if we're really lucky, we, we're able to actually help uh, identify the, at least the, the years of production of a particular pen, of where that came from. 
Here's a sample of uh, a client calling me and said, uh, there, there's a signature that I, I, I know for a fact is it's, it's a copy. It's a, zero, it's, a, it's, it's a result of a Xerox copy, okay? Now this is where the whole thing of I don't care comes in, all right? Because again, when clients call, they, they may be based on in, inaccurate information. They may be wrong. Well, for all we know, we may be lying. Now lawyers lie a lot. Okay, I don't trust them at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> but okay, maybe that was. I'm sorry, but uh, this is a situation where the client says, "I know for a, he knew for a fact that this was a signature that was caused by a, a Xerox copy. Someone copied it from a document, pasted it into another one, and just copied it off on a printer." It's like, okay, well, there's a, the way of. Finding that out, where's the original? I said, well, I don't have the original. It's at, a, it's, it's at the, the courthouse. I said, okay. So we went to the courthouse, and one of the little uh, tools that we have is a small microscope. It uh, also has a camera in it. We're able to take uh, copies or pictures of what it sees, both under visible light and infrared light. Okay? So I was given the original. And this is what it is under visible light, okay? I hit it with the infrared, and this showed up, okay? So based on that, now the client's swearing up and down, this is a Xerox copy. What do you think I tell the client? It's an original. It's what we call first generation signature, because if it was a copy, those two slides would look identical. Okay, so the, the ink from the pen and the ink from the printer, again, fluoresces at a different wavelength. So when we hit it with the infrared light, you see that discrepancy. Okay, just give uh, some highlights of uh, some cases that we worked on and how we approached it. This, this is an image of something that a client sent me uh, actually via email, and actually I, I forget what uh, the, the specifics of what she was wanting me to do, but uh, I remember that the, one of the questions was, I had asked her, is there any way you could tell me the date of this document? Because it will help me help, uh, you know, uh, examine the, the style of handwriting and uh, ascertain, you know, whether uh, whatever it was she, she was asking me to do. I think she was asking me about uh, one of the signatures on it. But uh, I had told her, well, that this, the style of writing is indicative of the early 1900s. I'd say 1910, 1920, somewhere in there. So if you could just tell me, or either email me the entire certificate, because that's all I got, or just tell me the date that this thing was supposed to have been written. And she she emailed me back, she said, damn, you're good. She said, this is a marriage certificate dated December 1920. Now, what, what do you think it is about that document that I could just look at it and say, oh, it's around 1910, 1920? Some of you older folks might know. You see at the line at the top where it says Fitchert? This T, how uh, it bows out like that, this only, and this only applies to T's or letter T's at the end of a word or a name. When it bows out like that, there's no T bar. This stroke being like that actually takes the place of the T bar. And as a result, that the, the T bar doesn't need to be written like that when the, the T stroke ends that way. That is a style of writing that was very common in the 1910s and 20s. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, I, I would uh, bet uh, that uh, some of your parents may have written their uh, T's or when, when their T's ended like that, that they wrote it that way. 
Okay. So it just goes to show that we're not just looking at handwriting. Okay, we're talking about, you know, handwriting examining. No, we're talking about the entire document. Okay. We're talking about, uh, you know, ink analysis, fiber analysis, watermark identification, that type of thing. And part of the examination is, and the knowledge is having to know, number one, you know, styles of handwriting during the course of a period or different uh, era or even styles of handwriting from other countries, okay? Because uh, over in Germany, they teach their children to do their M's and N's with a sharp top and over here, they teach the children how to write it with a rounded top. So when I see a document and, uh, you know, somebody's uh, tailored their, their signature or handwriting and they grew up in Germany, well, that's going to affect how I'm going to analyze or interpret that particular stroke in their handwriting. This was funny. This, this was one of the cases on Nancy that I got ended up on the editing floor. Uh, the story was uh, this lady was in a hospital for three days. Her housekeeper, uh, she was basically accusing her housekeeper to, that she stole a bunch of checks and forged her name to it and wrote, uh, wrote checks to herself. Now, the housekeeper is saying, no, it wasn't me. This woman wrote these checks to me when she was in a hospital, and she was just, you know, jacked up on morphine and painkillers. She doesn't remember doing any of it, but she wrote it, okay? So one of the things I explained to Nancy was like, okay, again, we're not just looking at the handwriting or signatures. We're looking at the, the document overall. The top check was a known sample. The two bottom checks were the question documents. Okay, the first, the top check, the known one, was written in advance of a, a of her hosp this woman's hospital stay, as like a cash advance to the the, the housekeeper for some some reason or another. Um, dated twelve four ten, and then the two bottom question checks, dated twelve six twelve six ten, the second of a three day hospital stay. And one thing I told asked Nancy, look. 849 is the top check, 850 is the, the middle check, 859 is the bottom check. I said, where's the other eight checks? So are we to believe that this woman, while she was laying in the hospital bed, wrote, you know, eight, check number 850, then she wrote eight more checks to God knows who, and then all of a sudden wrote another check you know, eight or nine checks later to this woman again. And then I went on to uh, reveal to the, exam uh, the signature is basically what happened is she evidently had taken checks from this woman from her house while she was in the hospital, uh, forged the 850 check, and then took her 859 number check, laid it on top of it, and copied it that way. And then when I was done with that, all of a sudden this lady for the whole episode was like, no, this woman, I, I, she was drug, drugged up. She wrote those checks. All of a sudden now she told Nancy, yeah, I wrote the checks. I, I did it. And I guess the producers thought, well, hey, she, she confessed. So they put, they put my section on the editing room floor. So the whole 20 minutes of the episode, you hear her say, I didn't write, no, I didn't write it. And then all of a sudden, like after the first commercial, yeah, I wrote the checks. <laughs> it is kind of funny how it kind of 